Hello and a warm welcome to today's webinar, How Green Bonds Are Financing Sustainable Development. I'm Hannes McNulty, Senior Green Industry Advisor at the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, and I'd like to thank you for being here with us today. The question of how we can facilitate funding for a sustainable transformation is one of the key challenges we face in this decade of action. Today, we delve into the opportunities, challenges, and broad potential of green bonds for driving forward sustainable development. Now, this webinar is the fourth session of a five-part GGKP webinar series held under the ICCI project, Green Economy Transformation in Cooperation with UN PAGE, Synergies Between Low Emission Pathways and the Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the GET project. The GET project is funded by the German Federal Ministry of Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety through its International Climate Initiative and is implemented by the German Development Agency, GIZ, in cooperation with the United Nations Environment Programme. This webinar is a joint effort of the GET project partnering with the UNDP and United Nations Environment Programme Poverty Environment Action Initiative, or PEA, both these initiatives jointly support the government of South Africa in advancing on green and sustainability bonds, including peer-to-peer -peer exchanges with other countries such as Indonesia and Argentina. So today we will hear from a group of experts and representatives from partner countries of the GET project and PEA. They will share their experiences and insights from working on green bonds at a national and local level and enter into a really open learning exchange with all of you. Before we get started though, I'd like also to take a brief moment to introduce the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, or GGKP as it is better known, a global network of experts and organizations dedicated to providing the policy, business and finance communities with knowledge, guidance, data and tools to transition to an inclusive green economy. If you aren't already familiar, I would encourage you to visit any of our three knowledge platforms. You have the Green Policy Platform, the Green Finance Platform, and the Green Industry Platform. I'm also really excited to announce that GGKP has launched the Green Forum. This is an online community space for sharing and discussing insights on a whole range of themes and issues re related to a green economic transformation. There will certainly be lots of discussion on green bonds and green finance more broadly, so do please register uh, at the greenforum.org. Now, throughout today's discussion, please do feel free to submit questions and comments as it's, it's really a fantastic opportunity to engage directly with the panel. After the webinar, we'd also appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete our short survey. Your feedback at the end of the day is really very important to us in helping us to yes. the webinars. Please note that a full recording of this webinar will be available on our website at ggkp.org forward slash Green Bonds Webinar 2021, shortly after the broadcast. You can also stay in the loop about future GGKP webinars by signing up to our newsletter at ggkp.org forward slash subscribe. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's event. Arthur Wood, founding partner of Total Impact Capital and recognized pioneer and innovator in social finance and impact investment. Arthur actually coined, coined the appellation market-based solutions to philanthropy back in 2005. Uh, he has held senior positions in financial institutions, including Dresdner, Kleinwort, Merrill and Coots, as well as in socially driven organizations, including Ashoka, Total Impact Advisors, the UN, and GCSP. Author has also written the UN's report on impact investing and a paradigm shift to outcome models for UNSCAP. He's also an expert advisor to the OECD on impact investing, G8 report, metrics and the implications of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. So without further ado, Arthur, I would be absolutely delighted to welcome you to today's webinar and hereby turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Hannes. Always a pleasure to uh, to follow uh, the dulcet tones of an Irishman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for attending today. 
Uh, after that introduction, you don't really need to hear much, uh, much from me in the scheme of things. Uh, it's a genuinely exciting opportunity that we are faced with, a, a booming capital market. Uh, as many of you will know, this started in 2007 uh, and has now reached roughly $1.3 trillion in terms of cumulative products. Uh, very substantive growth over last year, 22-30% growth uh, in terms of issuance. Uh, and indeed, this week, even my own government uh, had a sovereign issue of $10 billion um, of, a, of, a, of a green gilt. So an exciting booming market. Uh, and we ha I have the real pleasure of introducing uh, some experts uh, across, the, uh, across the globe uh, who have uh, pushed a range of uh, uh, innovative solutions, which we're going to hear from today and touch on hopefully the range of issues from uh, the size, the nature of the market, uh, the challenges they face, uh, and indeed, hopefully, the opportunities. Uh, so without further ado, let me take this opportunity to introduce them uh, in the inverse order that I have uh, on, uh, on, my, uh, on my sheet. Uh, Florencia Pooch Genale from uh, the Assistant Manager of Corporate Governance, National Securities, the Commission of Argentina. Uh, Dr. Yoko Trihayot Tom, uh, the Senior Researcher, Fiscal Policy Agency for Climate Change Financing and Multilateral Policy at the Ministry of Finance in Indonesia. Crystal Van Vuren, the Associate Director, Africa, the, the well-known Carbon Trust. Uh, Dolly Maffer, Director, Sustainability Finance Mechanism, uh, Tishwane Metropolitan. Uh, Maya Koldenko, uh, Director, Working Group on Sustainable Finance, the Ministry of Economy. Uh, and uh, Professor Peter Head, who I have the pleasure of working with, uh, who's the Chair of Resilience Brokers. Um, what we'd like to do now is sort of go straight into it, I guess, in the scheme of things. Uh, within the fr framework of this discussion, we're going to touch on why are the, what are fit for purposes green finance structures, how are the municipalities approaching the question of green bonds in the context of their mandates, uh, and what is the purpose of national green taxonomies, and what are the key opportunities uh, for mutual learning. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker uh, in, our, in our agenda today. We're going to do a tour de table uh, and ask the question, what is your experience with green bonds so far? Uh, what are your needs and interests? Uh, so first off, South Africa. Christelle, if I can call on you. Great. Thanks very much, Arthur, indeed. And I think actually, um, if you'll forgive me, Monene, uh, you're online with us from the city of Twani, uh, which is a, a decentralized government uh, in South Africa. And Monene is going to share their perspectives, and I'll follow on. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank Monene, you. over to you. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, um, colleagues. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to be here to represent uh, the city of Tswane, um, as well as to uh, to represent uh, the country of South Africa. Um, in our uh, city of Tswane, in terms of uh, our experience with the green bonds, uh, we are still in the um, sort of the planning uh, phase of uh, the green bond. So we're in the process of uh, understanding our institutional arrangements, understanding our processes, um, and uh, trying to um, you know, gain uh, insight and knowledge into how the uh, green bond um, facility can then be used within our city. So far, we have embarked on a journey of um, uh, uh, trying to institutionalize the, the process. We have it as part of our capital planning. We have, uh, uh, we are sensitizing colleagues in terms of capital planning uh, to make considerations into climate impact, looking at their projects, um, which projects can uh, then include green elements with, within them um, so that uh, we can then, um, you know, through the capital planning process, making sure that we have uh, projects that actually can meet the green criteria. Um, that would then enable us to then uh, diversify our funding base. Uh, so currently we have only uh, our normal bonds. We don't have green bonds within uh, the city of Tswane. Um, so the aim is uh, in future to be able to qualify to then uh, to issue green bonds. Uh, and as part of that, we need to make sure that the projects that we have um, with, within our portfolio have those elements. Um, that are, are looking at uh, impact uh, of you know climate change, uh, looking at the mitigation and, and adaptation aspects, and um, then also in terms of uh, the financing side, uh, 
financial management side of our uh, processes to make sure that then our processes can then be able to account for those funds and the utilization of those funds, um, making sure that we are able to then uh, um, uh, uh, record them in a way that will then um, enable us to then uh, tag uh, the, the expenditure that is um, that is related to you know so that at any point in time we are able to then extract inform uh, information financial information that will be able to then uh, show what those proceeds from the green bonds were used against uh, so currently we we are uh, basically um uh, I can say we are we are in the process of uh, developing a framework which will then uh, inform the, the the city in terms of the arrangements that need to be in place and the approval processes that would need to be in place and then obviously all the steps that would need to be followed uh, as part of the issuing of a green bond. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much indeed. So you're very much in listening mode and and list, li wanting to learn from. Uh, the, the other participants. Uh, and I think you've touched on some issues in terms of issuance and certainly in terms of how we monitor uh, the actual impact and the taxonomies ar around this, uh, this issue, which is a critical one. Uh, Yoko, if I can hand over to you, um, I believe you've launched one of the first Sukuk bonds uh, of a substantive size. Um, so I think you probably need to explain to people what a Sukuk bond is. Um, it's clearly a slightly different derivation from, from the mainstream, but, but over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you, uh, Arthur. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, the government of Indonesia actually is uh, not yet issued the green bond, yeah, like Arthur mentioned before, but we already issued the first uh, green suko in the world. Yeah. Green suko means uh, we uh, issued uh, green together with the Islamic system in 2018 and follow annually yeah 2019 2020 and also the last time we issued last June yeah and this is uh, quite uh, surprising because we can solve uh, our last green suko sovereign green suko we can solve almost uh, 30 years old 30 years a uh, period uh, with uh, uh, this is the the first uh, uh, longest uh, ever uh, sovereign green suko uh, issue in the world. So this is uh, our our uh, pride and also uh, very proud with with this mechanism. And then since 2019, actually, uh, besides we go to the international market with the international currency, actually we also go to the domestic market with uh, individual uh, customer. And then from the green uh, sovereign green suko, from the global green suko, we diversify our uh, type, our uh, market mechanism. In 2019, we issued the first domestic market. We call it uh, so called is uh, 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 green suko retail in 2019 and also in 2020. Uh, perhaps next month, uh, uh, we will uh, issue yeah, the the newest uh, green super retail in 2021. And uh, last month also, uh, we issued the first SDG bond in Indonesia with a 12 years tenor in a, a euro currency with a yield almost 1.35%. So this is uh, 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 reinforced and also complete with our uh, commitment. And refresh our experience when we uh, process and also issued all type of the uh, very innovative financial scheme. Uh, I mean, we deal with the market, yeah, green suko, green suko retail, uh, SDG bond. Uh, we think that we need some extra and also bonus treatment for us. Because when when we issued the, the green one and compare with uh, conventional one, we think that we have no differentiation. Refers from the administration fee, refers from the uh, 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 type of uh, interest rate. So uh, we have no incentive in terms of uh, monetize if we uh, will uh, issue the green one. Even though if we compare when we issue the green one uh, and also the conventional one, of course, the green one is 
uh, costly rather than conventional one. If we will issue the conventional one, uh, conventional bond or suku, you know that we just need to prepare a country portfolio and then we go to the market without any kind of preparedness. But uh, a bit different when we will issue the green one. First, we have uh, construct our green framework and then our uh, framework discussed and also reviewed by the international based uh, reviewer. From the Indonesian experience, we review by Cicero, the best, the best one uh, reviewer in the world uh, on the green suko and also green bond uh, uh, global. And then after they agree, they gave us uh, setting, and of course we must pay them. <laughs> yeah, we must pay them with our own money. Yeah, so if we compare the conventional one with the uh, the green one. Uh, we think we have no incentive yeah because in terms of administration fee in terms of interest uh, uh, payment we have no differentiation from the green one and also the conventional one and don't forget after we sold our green suko sdg bond and also green suko retail we have mandatory to develop our green impact report annually because this is like the mandatory investor must be willing to read and also to know where uh, his or her money uh, will go to the appropriate uh, purposes. So this is a, a very cost. Yeah. So if if the international can support us, I mean the international can prove their commitment because issuing the green one is not cheaper. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much, Yoko. That, that's an interesting observation for uh, what is referred to as greenium, I believe, in, in, in the market. Uh, the premium that is actually uh, normally associated with green bonds, meaning that uh, uh, corporate investors have, an, have a vested interest in issuing a green bond because there is a, it raises their money at a cheaper level. You're saying that's not the case. And I think it'd be an interesting question to uh, to delve further into that perhaps later in the questions as to whether that's a function of size or whether it's a function of the uh, the cook structure that, you, that you're operating within. Uh, but uh, And clearly the issue of regulatory frameworks uh, and the ability to cheaply and quickly and commoditize those judgments is obviously gets the cost argument as well, which I assume we'll touch later. Now, thank you very much. Uh, now, I have in my notes uh, that we have Argentina next, and, and we are very fortunate to have two people from Argentina, uh, Florencia and Maya, and I must, must admit incompetence as to whether I know it's Maya or, or Florencia uh, is, 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 is due to speak next. I'm going to, to speak in the, the question. Excellent, thank you very much, Florencia, my apologies. Thank you very much. Don't worry. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor for us to participate here and share what we have done in Argentina regarding a green bond. I'm the assistant manager of corporate governance at the National Security Commission, known as CMB. We are the national body in charge of the promotion, supervision, and control of capital market in Argentina. Regarding the question, the CMB has been working on promoting sustainable finance in 2019. The CMB was the first regulator in publishing the guidelines for issue green, social and sustainable bonds in Argentina. The aim of this guideline was to raise awareness about the existence of financial instruments that can generate profit, but also social or environmental impact. These guidelines are divided in two main parts. One of them is focused on capacity building around the sustainable market and green and social and sustainable bonds. These guidelines also point out international standards accepted by the CMB, such as IGMA principles and climate bond standards. We believe that using international standards increase the possibility of attracting foreign investors. The second part of the guideline is focused on the process of issue green, social or sustainable bonds and describe the four ICMA principle components adapted to the local legislation. I must add that after publishing these guidelines, Bolsas y Mercados Argentinos, the largest stock exchange in Argentina, launched their own green social and sustainable panel, a, guide, a guideline to green social and sustainable bonds 
and a regulation that contained the requirements to list the green bonds in there. In order to be part of the panel, the issuer must submit an external review from an independent third party who is experienced in environmental and social matters. The prospectus must have a description of the social, green and sustainable projects that are going to be financed or refinanced. And finally, the issuer must submit every year an updated report informing the use of proceeds and describing the project to which the funds were allocated. So, to sum up, the regulation of green, social and sustainable bonds in Argentina are the CMB guidelines and the regulation of BIMA for the green and sustainable panel. Currently, there are 12 listed bonds in BIMA panel that, many, that finance many projects. For example, a creation of a plan for vaccine production, including coronavirus vaccine, the financing or refinancing the development, building of wine, solar and green energy. And finally, other bonds were issued to create internet work and, build, and to build houses for low income population. And finally, in order to continue promoting green bond and also responsible investment, the CMB has published three guidelines. A guideline for issues social, green and sustainable bond that is similar to the first one but updated. A guideline for socially responsible investment in Argentina capital market and a guideline for external reviewers of green, social and sustainable bond. The aim of this guideline was to encourage capital market participants to get involved into the sustainable market and understand it as a way of financing projects with social or environmental impact. Regarding the needs or interest, currently the CMB is focused all its resources on the development of the sustainable market. And that's why we are still at the stage of capacity building for the market participant and also for the CMB's employees. In the near future, the CMB will strengthen the supervision of the green and social and sustainable bonds according to the best policies and regulatory practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florencia. Uh, I think you've touched on one issue. Um, perhaps I can ask a question to you and also to, to Yoko. Uh, in terms of the the markets you talk about, are you talking about the local capital markets or the international capital markets? Local Before, capital market. Local. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the same for you, Yoko. Uh, uh, we put yeah. We issued a put uh, uh, in the international market and also on the domestic market. Like I mentioned before, that when we issue the first uh, green suko, sovereign green suko, it means that we deal with the international market, with the international currency. But in 2019, actually, we diversify, we create the new diversify from the green suko, yeah, because we uh, uh, deal with the in, with the domestic market, with the uh, domestic currency. Okay, excellent. And in terms of South Africa, Crystal, maybe. In terms of the local market here, so the Johannesburg Stock Exchange has quite a, um, I think, a strong presence in terms of its being a member of the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative um, and has a sustainability segment. Um, and there's been quite a lot of private sector activity. And when I say quite a lot, I mean, f within the African context, it's been quite significant and it's been growing in time. That is predominantly driven through financial corporates. Um, but part of this program for example and others are is looking towards the growth and continued expansion of both the, the number of listings and the significance of the capital there um, as well as broadening the the segment itself to provide more offerings uh, and more opportunities for such a transition um, and now looking at sustainably linked uh, instruments as well so it's it's quite a dynamic space in which the stock exchange itself is leading the charge on market development but in the context of quite a lot of other activity that's also taking place by uh, development funding and by individual actors themselves. Okay, and that's in the local capital market? Again, in the local capital market. So we have seen, uh, I want to say, uh, a number of examples of, of, of dual listing and international listing, but again, within the context sort of, sort of 12 or 15 bonds, when you have two, it's, it's, uh, it's not insignificant, but within a small sample. Okay. I'm asking this because next question by John, John Mashek uh, up on the screen. 
uh, talking about uh, the, the various green taxonomies, uh, because clearly if it's within your local capital market and you can incentivize people within local regulation, that somewhat fudges the issue about whether you go with the EU taxonomy or the, uh, the International Capital Markets Association. Uh, but perhaps we can come back to that point. Um, next question, uh, moving on. Uh, Maya, I believe it's a, you also from Argentina are, are next up uh, with the question, uh, why are fit-for-purpose green finance frameworks necessary? Florencia, thank you very much indeed. Maya, I shall hand over to you. Well, can you hear me well? Yes, right. crystal clear and clear. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for, for the opportunity. For Thanks, Arthur, for, for the presentation and, and for the invitation. Uh, to all the organizers, I'm so glad to share with you all our experiences and lessons learned as part of the Ministry of Economy of Argentina, um, where I'm heading the International Affairs Unit, and also we have the opportunity, as uh, well, I'm the deputy of the G20, and also and others, other fora that we participate, um, the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, the International Sustainable Finance Platform, to promote. Um, our experience and share experience and interchange, right? Uh, that that's that's very important. And also, I like to touch upon it, and specifically, what are we leading from Argentina, from the Ministry of Economy? This is the technical roundtable on sustainable finance that gets together all the um, the public stakeholders uh, of the the country and the the capital market uh, participants from the public sector together to develop a national uh, strategy of sustainable finance and it's important and it's important to take into consideration that, that that's important to have this round table and that we can sit together to develop a national strategy for sustainable finance it's very important because it will avoid this uh, one size fits all approach like just to consider the development stage, consider the development of our capital market that clearly needs to be more developed. So all together we can uh, build and uh, try to foster and develop this market and uh, foster sustainable finance in the country according to our country circumstances and learn by, from others and how to catalyze these investments. Uh, and the, um, the impact investment in the country. Uh, so I can tell you a little bit about our achievements uh, as part of the work to advance this long-term strategy. We are developing in a collaborative way with the main public stakeholders of the, uh, uh, as I said, of the Argentine financial, financial system. This, uh, we already agreed among ourselves a roadmap to foster sustainable finance in the country for the short and the middle term. We just recently signed a, a joint declaration by the, regulator, the regulators of the Argentine banking and insurance capital market sectors to promote sustainable finance in the country and to advance in the analysis of climate-related financial risks. In line with this, as part of the implementation process of the roadmap, uh, I will highlight that this roundtable is working with different partners, such as the uh, IDB, the UNDP, the UK PAC, uh, what, and others, uh, and a sustainable, we also development a bond uh, framework, well, a sustainable bond framework to be, to establish standards to promote the financing of projects to achieve development while allowing diversification of Argentina investor base, reducing financing costs and continuing with sustainable debt management. And continue, uh, yes, to, uh, well, develop a sustainable debt management and also with the aim of supporting the most vulnerable population uh, while protecting the environment. This is, uh, this will be a key milestone we, if we can agree and develop sooner the sustainable bond framework uh, because it will also allow for sovereign uh, debt issuance uh, in the country. So this is basically my main points that I, I would like, I wanted to, to discuss. And perhaps if I may ask you a quick question, in sure. terms of uh, that framework, are you looking towards the European Union category, the international capital markets, or, or what, what, what's the framework that you're drawing up together? And, and do you think you could learn from, obviously, from South Africa exactly. or Indonesian experience? Yes, certainly. Certainly, learning from others is part of our um, uh, part of the strategy. Actually, we've been doing that 
particularly in the region. We've been sitting with other countries in the region to understand how they are developing their own framework. We already had talks with Mexico, with Brazil, with others. And with the help of these partners, also we can uh, also learn from, from the best experiences. And actually, we are going to specifically also work with the, with the UK, uh, with the, their own experience, uh, with the bond, to develop this bond framework. Very good, excellent. Uh, Christelle, I believe uh, you're, you're next up in the in the in the uh, in the discussion. Uh, what's South Africa's view on this? Are you developing your own specific standards and frameworks, or are you looking to the frameworks, the the international frameworks that are being drawn together? Great, thanks, Arthur. Um, so, I mean, perhaps I'll take a take a step here and say there's there is a lot that's happening in South Africa over the last two years especially, I mean, preceding that also, but it's really, uh, the momentum has built so much and there's been such a lot of coalition work that it's really an extremely exciting place to be at the moment. Also, emails are jammed and people are stretched, but it's uh, there's such a lot of cooperation that's also happening between private sector and public sector and industry bodies and others. So a lot of momentum, but that also comes with a lot of work to, to keep sort of ensuring that you're aligning, aligning, aligning. <laughs> Um, so, from a from the perspective of the a sovereign perspective, I think that we're at quite an early stage of of considering all of these things. There's been a lot of work done and a lot of I would say external advisory that's been done. There's work about capacity building, and the, I think that the organ that the the nation is looking internationally to examples to both. Uh, encourage it, but also that it would leverage off. Um, in some places, it's leveraging, and in others, I think that the the, or, the we believe that we have a head start in certain key social issues, especially, which we can again bring to the table when we're, we're developing or participating in things like G20 uh, negotiations and others. So the, at any rate, the point is, I think that there's a lot of alignment and domestication that's continuously happening. And in that space, that means that there are um, sustainable finance frameworks that are being developed. There are um, climate finance strategies that are underway. Um, and we've got a lot of the like, and I know we'll be discussing it just now, such as the green finance taxonomy, as well. So all of these measures, as well as the domestication and implementation of TCFD recommendations and regulations. And so there's, a, there's, there's movement that's happening in lots of spaces. If we look just at the sustainable bonds framework or the bonds framework as an investor relations tool and as a procedural document, the space in which we've got these examples in the South African context is at sub-sovereign and in private sector instances. And from that perspective, the work that we're doing um, in this program is very much to look at leveraging uh, learnings um, and leveraging what we see out there as good practice um, example. But and I think this comes to part of what the question is asking around fit for purpose, just in that particular tool, um, is that irrespective of what kind of actor you are in undertaking an issuance, it reflects your vision and your context. And I think that this also comes from what I hear that the Argentinian colleagues are also saying is that it's, it's founded in the national objective, for example. So there is a context that has to be borne in mind um, that, then ultimately through this bond framework, in our view in any case, there's almost a golden thread that should be thread through, through from that contextual and vision base through all the way to what are the kinds of projects, if you think about use of proceeds models, that you want to have see take shape and therefore be encompassed by the framework itself. The other reason that I think that it's vital that it is a reflection of the uh, issuing organization um, is that there are as much as there are standards and you seek to align to them, of course, because there are regulatory and um, harmonization reasons to do so. If we think about the sub sovereign example, such as a, a city or a municipality in South Africa, it needs to be closely linked to the debt and the regulatory frameworks that are in place. Um, it needs to be linked to their own personal social license to operate. Uh, and as well as their own particular capital planning uh, and the multifaceted approaches to their programming, which is again very jurisdictionally specific, um, as well as the individual needs that they have to cooperate with other spheres of government. And then just as a last point, I think that having a, a sustainable bonds framework or a green finance framework in the bond issuance realm that is a reflection of the issuing organization is that it leverages internal procedures which are simply unique um, and 
because of the fact that all of that exists already and you can align and leverage and integrate, sustainable issuances or sustainable finance by and large becomes a mainstreamed issue rather than a parallel issue. So it doesn't sort of isolate sustainable finance from the practice of core functions for those particular organizations. And that's, in my view, in any case, an absolutely vital part of what any of these kinds of capacity building programs can achieve is that mainstreaming of sustainable finance conceptually and procedurally within institutions. Maybe I'll stop there. I hope that's a useful contribution. Uh, that that's extremely useful. I mean, I think what you've all touched on is is the exciting opportunity of mobilizing local capital markets to get to the SDGs, something that's often ignored in the developed world. And the fact that there is two trillion that sits in local pension funds in local currencies and up to up to five million in, in various other local currencies. And, and what you've all touched upon is that exciting opportunity. Uh, Yoko, clearly the Islamic market, I, the last thing I saw from Goldman Sachs saying it was roughly three to four trillion dollars and it never ceases to amaze me, some of the great innovation that you see out of Malaysia and, and Indonesia. Uh, perhaps you can answer the same question from the perspective of Islamic financing. I think you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, if, if we see, uh, if we compare with the Malaysia, uh, I think, uh, Malaysia is the, the, the first issuer, but uh, the, the issuer mostly come from the private company, uh, a, a bit different than the, the government of Indonesia because the, the, the government initiate to issue uh, our uh, sovereign green support. But uh, uh, currently, actually, we, we are still uh, have a, a big problem. Why the government uh, uh, doing the first issuer and then uh, hopefully the the private company and also the corporation will follow what the government already done. But this is still our problem currently because uh, even the, the government, particularly from the fiscal, fiscal aspect, yeah, from the uh, financing uh, fiscal policy, we already uh, give uh, so many incentives. But the, the, the big problem currently in Indonesia is the private company is not uh, follow what the government already done. If we compare the number of uh, issuing green bond, green suko or SDG bond from the private company is still low. So this is uh, what we try to uh, overcome through the uh, creating the first Indonesian uh, green taxonomy because we think that uh, perhaps through the the issuing uh, green taxonomy, perhaps we can eager and also encouraging from the banking system, from the private company to uh, follow and also uh, run as fast as what we uh, already done. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I mean, I think probably we should we should open this up to the the broader discussion uh, in terms of how the this frames it in terms of, of mobilizing local capital markets. But before we go there, uh, the next question is, uh, how are the municipalities approaching the question of green bonds in the context of their mandates? Uh, Dolly, over to you. I think you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Um, uh, Moneme uh, speaking. Uh, Dolly is one of my colleagues um, within our sustainability unit. Um, so, um, in in the in the context of uh, a city of Swami, so we um, have have started with um, so, so in in terms of approaching the green bonds. So we have uh, looked at, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, making sure we are setting up the framework. Uh, that would then guide the entire process um, in terms of, of uh, uh, green bonds and sustainable financing. We've also got, um, so we, we've also now, we are also mainstreaming the, the whole process within our capital planning processes, where we are making sure that all our uh, different uh, departments who have uh, various mandates in terms of housing, in terms of roads and transport, in terms of 
um, uh, utilities, uh, you know, water and energy, making sure that, um, you know, the projects that are within those areas, because um, those are our main, uh, those are where our main capital projects are taking place in terms of infrastructure and road, building roads, building houses. Um, uh, so making sure that they uh, they become aware of um, you know greener alternatives, they become aware of um, elements of green way that they can bring into their project, um, and all and obviously that uh, to make sure that that happens, um, you know, as part of the planning processes, we have our sustainability units uh, that go that are part of the meetings that are part of the. The, the expenditure, the planning, uh, the capital planning and the capital budgeting, and they ask the questions about how they are incorporating um, the the green elements. Where where have they incorporated, um, you know, uh, elements of uh, sustainable financing or su sustainable It's um, it's it's in doing that that is making sure that people actually start thinking about um, you know and they start mainstreaming and it becomes the norm that they think about uh, sustain more sustainable elements and not just continuing um, as we have been um, in the past, um, but also just making sure that it, so as and also as we are having the. Um, uh, as we are building the framework that we're making sure that we are bringing in all our counterpart departments into the discussions um, about what it would mean once we uh, issue green bonds, what it would mean in terms of making sure that we're able to account for the, the spending uh, and the use of those proceeds so that um, we can all start looking at our, our current processes and uh, look at where we would potentially have the gaps and where we would need to then um, sort of um, um, build onto our current processes um, to make sure that then the, um, the, the in delivering of our services as part of our mandate um, that we are uh, definitely um, uh, moving towards more greener, um, having a more greener impact on the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for standing in for your colleague. Uh, I, I guess a lot of these these issues have all touched on the, the nature of standards. Uh, and for what I've understood from your comments, you're, you're each developing national standards for your own local capital markets. So I guess a question is, I mean, bankers like simplicity of terms and commoditization of terms, and that's what takes costs out. Um, so I guess the question is, how would you see uh, collaborating together, and I guess that's the role that the GGKKP performs, uh, in terms of how do we draw together the, the national greening taxonomies that, that you're each developing for your markets, uh, and how those integrate also into the, the EU and the ICCA standards, because clearly standards is where which gets us to uh, cost efficiency and scale. So if I could ask each of you to, to comment uh, in terms of that framing, what is the purpose of your, your national uh, green taxonomies? I'll, I'll, I'll throw it open to, uh, to, to all of you. Um, Pat, Pat Yoko, if you want to go, go first. Uh, like I mentioned before, yeah. uh, uh, why the purposes on the national green taxonomy? For us, from the central government, we think that the green taxonomy is a mandate by our government regulation. Because in 2017, actually, we issued what uh, uh, so-called the the economic uh, environment instrument, and uh, uh, from from that regulation. One of mandate is government must be set our green taxonomy. Green taxonomy also created in order to speed up and encouraging support from the monetary and also from the banking system, like I mentioned before, because us from the, the fiscal policy, we already uh, uh, done with so many uh, very innovative financial schemes. And we, we think that from the monetary system and also from the banking system, they are uh, still a uh, need to support yeah so uh, through the green taxonomy perhaps we can uh, support the uh, monetary and also uh, the other financial system uh, to uh, to do uh, same step with what the uh, ministry of finance is already done uh, 
that's that's my uh, two cents, Arthur. Thank you very much, and a very useful two cents. Uh, South Africa, if I, you, you're clearly at the early stages of this, you're clearly looking at the various taxonomies out there. What, what's your view on this? Yeah, absolutely. I'll jump in there. Um, so we're again lucky enough to be involved in the process to actually develop the first South African green finance taxonomy um, in our context. Uh, and I think I've, I'm, we're sort of answering back there in terms of that we have uh, well, when I say we, uh, in terms of the structures that gave rise to the project, which is developing this taxonomy, um, sought to leverage the EU taxonomy development. And there were various reasons around that. Uh, we're an emerging market with significant FDI, uh, with the ambition to attract international capital increasingly. Um, at the same time, we're also cognizant of a lot of internal and, and national um, Again, studies and necessity for coalescing uh, views and policy perspectives on what constitutes green and all of the conflicting, uh, well, in the past conflicting, but now increasingly um, cooperative issues around social, and environmental and trade-offs that used to be, but we're seeking to no longer have that kind of narrative um, uh, in the long term. But at any rate, um, to point out a few things, the one is the taxonomy is under development and I can, I can run into a little bit of detail around its progress and processes. Um, but uh, it was initially entailing uh, the development of a voluntary tool. Um, it was a, a market launched coalition um, that brought the project to fore, uh, very kindly supported in its phase one by uh, the International Finance Corporation. Um, but subsequent to that, um, there are now increasing discussions around what's been called deepening. So in other words, that what was a voluntary tool, even if it were modeled on international example um, and domesticated from that uh, international example, actually starts to have either formally or informally a role uh, in markets um, that actors, especially leading actors are starting to point to it um, and that the likes of uh, listings might well start to take it into account. So it obviously has this bigger picture um, uh, implication, even when it wasn't intended to be necessarily uh, a formalized part of the enabling environment. I think what the process of developing the taxonomy over the past 18 odd months has given rise to is that it actually has come to be much more than just a tool. Again, it's just sort of a dictionary, right? It's just a register with technical standards, but it's become almost a larger than life conversation around what is the necessity for alignment to international uh, finance expectations? What granularity must it have? What are the issues that we're trying to deal with as a nation? Uh, and what are the domestic objectives for capital allocation that we're seeking to achieve? Um, so there's been a lot in terms of a tool for change and an economic reference that it's taken format. Um, and then, so the point is, at the moment, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, again, just as our local uh, debt listing market in reference to what we're talking about here, um, is uh, referencing ICMA. Um, so it, it's taken that perspective, but even there we see that national jurisdictional taxonomies having uh, interstitial tissue because of the way that the ICMA standard itself seems to be evolving to make reference to these uh, uh, jurisdictional instruments. Um, so even if we're Again, it's that kind of cooperation, shift along, kind of move in, in tandem process that's happening all the time in all of these standards developments. I think at the end of the day, we're likely to, to quite strongly stick with what we see happening in uh, the developed markets, um, even as we contextualize it for our own uh, needs. So you, you're touching, Graham, if I'm wrong, on the whole relationship of... Uh, is the investment actually creating a green impact? Is it actually impacting uh, climate or is it greenwashing and giving fees to bankers um, to be, to be blunt <laughs> in the scheme of things? Uh, yes, Maya, uh, Maya uh, what, what's your experience in, in Latin America? Because again, you, you've noted the, this same trend to, to, to local, local standards, uh, but a reference to international standards. Great, yes, thank you. Yes, we, we also believe that, well, for, for developing the market, we really need to develop a, a, and construct this taxonomy. We are following all the regional experiences and also the international developments. <laughs> of course, the EU, the EU the, also recently, well, Colombia, Mexico. Now, we also will, will start looking at, at other regions of the world. I'm impressed by, by what just learned from, from South Africa and also, well, uh, from Indonesia. Um, 
we, as part of the implementation process of the roadmap on sustainable finance, we will start to analyze the viability of developing this national or green or sustainable taxonomy. We don't have yet a comprehensive taxonomy. We feel that it's needed and it's needed to improve the market, but uh, it's part of, of what are we uh, starting to work on now. Uh, is because yes, uh, we, with different parts of, of the country, stakeholders, this is important. We work collaboratively with other, as, as with other parts of our um, roadmap with other partners to develop this taxonomy. In particular, we, the UNDP, we will work on this particular aspect of the of our roundtable and national strategy for sustainable finance. Um, we know and we know that several frameworks have already been developed around the world, but we still feel also, and it has been said, that we need to have more collaboration across the board. Um, the proliferation of different approach could also generate, we feel, market fragmentation, increased trans transactions costs, and lead to green and uh, well, greenwashing, as, as you recently said. So we we are working on the G20 on this and to try to uh, improve this comparability, interoperability, and transparency of definition, labeling, verification, and other tools to to have and to identify these sustainable finance opportunities. Um, so well. No, so this this is very important. We still uh, need to improve this in the country. We are very much involved in this topic, and as it was recently said, also uh, the perspective of an emerging economy is critical, and the particularities of it, the, our markets that it's still also our local market needs to be more developed, uh, and we are also working on this, as my colleague from the CMB just said, and. Also, the private sector of Argentina is very much involved, and we are trying and starting to work together to find ways, uh, well, to collaborate and to to improve this this work together as well. Excellent, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I guess this also touches upon, I'm assuming that the, the vast majority of these issuances are investment grade in your own local local economies. Uh, I guess it also raises a very interesting issue about the potential creation of a guarantee, a Western guarantee structure that would guarantee local bonds in their own country for their own essential sustainable development. Uh, I was tangentially involved in one of these things uh, and I was genuinely surprised at the, 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 the potential and scale of the capital uh, that could be unleashed by a guarantee entity guaranteeing local bonds in, in local currency so that we don't just look at the, the municipal issues, we can go further down uh, into the market. Um, Christelle, I, I believe you you worked on a on a on a handbook uh, from the carbon trust perspective, um, which again is another element in this mechanism. Perhaps I can ask you to say a few words about that. Great, absolutely, Arthur. Thank you very much. And that's uh, just to give some context in terms of the handbook that we're we're referring to is that very kindly supported through the UNDP UNEP Poverty Environment Action Initiative. Um, in partnership with ICI funded and, and GIZ unit uh, implemented uh, GET project that's already been described uh, earlier in today's uh, program. Um, together with PAGE, of course, we've had very many um, extraordinary uh, uh, forms of support uh, from the various partners um, and working closely with the, Dep the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment in South Africa. So a, a real coalition effort um, on this project. Um, Part of the scope of work was to develop a handbook specifically for sustainable so sorry South African municipalities looking to issue sustainable bonds. Um, again, that's into domestic capital markets uh, and trying to contextualize um, what is happening and what their mandates and social license would uh, would drive for. Um, that project does contain other elements to it. Uh, we've also undertaken quite some capacity building and that capacity building work uh, tried to also not just do the, the high level introductory elements, but really dig into uh, the details uh, and dig into um, hopefully allowing uh, the individual uh, members of the organizations in these municipalities uh, to understand what their particular roles are, what the technicalities are, and how they can take that forward. So the point is the handbook, the handbook itself should be published early next year. Um, it's gone through extensive local and international review, which has been also an exciting process to see what the differences are and the interpretations are. Um, but um, 
what it is, it's principally aimed at South African um, municipalities. It seeks to set the context for them within the South African uh, landscape, within their own um, socioeconomic development and sustainable development, as well as sustainability of financing, because that's a key issue um, for any government of whatever sphere, but in any case, is the, the fiscal um, uh, planning that has to take place um, for any kind of debt issuance. Uh, but take all of that into account and start to link together what sustainable bonds role could be within that landscape and then take the next step to say understanding sustainable bonds within sustainable financing within financing uh, and the inevitable and supported drive towards having that be mainstream rather than niche um, is then actually the handbook aimed to be really practical so we aimed, it's a little bit of a longer document um, than what is typically seen out there at the, at the moment, but it, it wanted to advance beyond value proposition and simple depictions to actually bridging technical understanding gaps. Because in our view, that's one of the main hesitance areas, aside from many others, no doubt, um, is just the, how do I actually do this? And I have all of these worries and the materials don't answer those worries for me. Now, We've needed to take that part way in the handbook. Of course, each individual um, potential prospective issuer may well have very specific elements. And some of the points that have been, been raised by Indonesian colleagues around costs and burden um, and the particularities of market receptiveness are things that a handbook can't necessarily answer in its own right. But um, it starts to set those out as the real questions that should be asked uh, up front. Anyway, the point is the handbook will be available next year um, and we've been using it as a tool set for us to actually undertake other parts of this process with the, the two uh, municipalities we've been working with. So very closely with my colleague uh, Munene um, at the city of Twani um, and also with the municipality um, uh, of Etikweni, which is um, as it was Durban. Um, and it's been a really exciting process uh, to work with them to start to embed the understanding of both the instrument um, and how it would be managed and governed and practically executed. Um, but beyond that, also the much more exciting conversations that are starting to coalesce as those internal networks are built um, between sustainability units and financing units um, and uh, operationally delivering units, where all of those come together um, in this particular space for them. Um, I'm going to probably leave it there because I'm not quite sure of the time that I've spent already, but oh, uh, that, to that. say, that it's, it's really been great and it's part of the whole, again, this kind of very exciting zeitgeist in the South African landscape at the moment around sustainable finance as well. So it's been great to be part of that. Excellent. And, 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 and I think what's genuinely interesting about this conversation uh, is how local capital markets are, are, are stepping up and being empowered. And I guess that gets back to my other point about how do you deepen that further by the use of Western guarantee structures? I mean, that would require a substantive investment, half a billion dollars for somebody to create that. Uh, but that offers the opportunity to really deepen these markets uh, in terms of exactly what you've, you've all touched upon. Uh, I guess it's interesting from my perspective, because obviously a lot of the conversation uh, currently in the green bond market is about the role of, of sovereigns um, in Western countries and, and the large issuances that they, they're now making that is, that is in essence driving this market. Uh, but what you're signaling is, is this, this large opportunity in terms of, of the local capital markets uh, and the empowerment of those local capital markets and what are going to be the standards, what are going to be the processes uh, that you don't have to all reinvent, hopefully in silos, you can collaborate on, which is obviously the excellent work that's been done by GGKP uh, and the ability to provide to the finance community uh, clear processes of how they do this, a, a common language uh, in terms of, of actually implementing. Uh, I, I shall shut up there because you've heard far too much from me during this event uh, and I'd quite like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Peter Head. Uh, Peter has been described uh, by The Guardian, CNN and Time uh, as one of the 50 people most likely to create global systems change uh, and he's been heavily involved in in China and in the developing world and indeed the UK as well uh, in not only in his professional career building bridges but also building system solutions um, to uh, to development so Peter if I hand over to you what are your observations in terms of how this uh, conversation uh, fits in terms of the mobilization of capital markets uh, for social good and the systems planning 
uh, framework that, that, that you have in mind, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a World Bank report has indicated that you could potentially shave 45% of the costs out of the SDGs. Peter, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Arthur. Um, I've been listening intently and, and with great interest. And I think Manani particularly put a finger on on the great challenge, which is you've got lots of different departments in your in your city regional government who are all trying to do different things. And how do you get them all to start thinking green? And how do you get them to come together to deliver transformational change using these instruments? Um, and I think we would all agree that what we don't want is to carry on with the projects that we were going to do before, but just pretend that they're green by by providing some justification for them. Uh, what we're really looking for, I think, a transformational change, which means doing different things. So I, I was one of the authors of the Sustainable Development Goal 11 for cities. And in 2015, after we had uh, got that, uh, the gavel came down in New York, a group of us came together and said, wouldn't it be really useful to create a roadmap for financing the sustainable development goal delivery or the global goal delivery in city regions. And so um, I'm going to drop into the into the chat um, a couple uh, links to a couple of pieces of work which I want to briefly mention. The first one is called Roadmap 2030, um, a route to uh, financing sustainable development goals in human settlements and city regions. And we analysed the, the background situation and particularly looked at the role of green bonds. And uh, all the evidence at that stage was that, that, that we need about 6% GDP a year invested in delivering the sustainable development goals um, if we take a, an approach which is similar to the ones we've done before. And most governments, particularly post-COVID, would argue that we just cannot, you know, the public sector cannot invest 6% GDP a year to deliver the sustainable development goals. It doesn't have that level of funding. Uh, and at the moment, the private sector is investing one to one and a half trillion out of a total of five trillion that's needed, which is only 20, 30%, um, which clearly leaves a massive funding gap. And so what we did was we looked at how that might be closed. Um, well, one solution is, of course, bringing forward green bonds and increasing the private sector um, investment. But the second one, which is actually much more powerful, as Arthur mentioned, is the looking at delivery of infrastructure as a system solution, which actually brings in nature-based solutions as well as uh, hard infrastructure with those working together. And the World Bank and others have done lots of work on this and have found that actually you can reduce the total cost of delivering the SDGs by as much as 40%. So instead of investing 6% GDP a year, you can come down to about 3.5% three, three to 3.8% GDP a year. And then if you've got um, private sector investment um, plus uh, climate and green bonds, then it's possible for them to bring in maybe up to 1% GDP uh, a year out of the 3.8 or, 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 or maybe even 2% um, together, which means that then the public sector investment requirement comes down to something which is a bit more manageable. So when you said earlier on that the return on investment, um, I think it was Yoko who said that return on investment from green stuff maybe isn't as good as the business as usual. The point about investing in the green stuff is to reduce the total cost by as much as 40% uh, as far as the government are concerned. So um, if you do that, then you can find ways of getting a return on your investment through the broader benefits that the whole, the whole project's bringing. So one is looking more widely at the benefits rather than just the individual benefits of one project. So, so what I would suggest is that it's a really good idea to think about a portfolio of projects in an integrated system, which can actually deliver the benefits as a whole. And one of the advantages of that is that individual projects can be quite risky, but if you've got a portfolio of projects you're investing in, it can be much lower risk, um, because if one goes down, you've still got others that the money is uh, supporting. So all in all, I would recommend taking an integrated systems approach. And in the second link I provided there, there was a, a paper that was produced, a policy brief for the G20 meeting in Saudi Arabia last year, 
which sets out how to take forward an integrated systems approach to deliver that saving, but also to provide a common data platform that can be used for design, for project delivery, and also for monitoring projects uh, in, their, in their final performance. So everybody has a common transparent understanding of both what projects will achieve in the, when you approve them for financing, but also monitoring them in delivery. And it's possible to create a common data environment to support systems delivery, but also in terms of the outcomes. So I hope that's fairly helpful. And those two links I've given you do actually provide quite a lot of background on what I've just said. Thank you very much, Peter. And then perhaps I can ask you a quick question and ask uh, members of the audience, whilst uh, Peter answers this question, to, to put any uh, specific questions or, or answers you have. We've got about 15 minutes. Uh, Peter, I mean, in, in terms of that type of framework, uh, I reckon that that probably also gets into fairly substantive governance issues uh, about where the data framing is, who controls it, and who has visibility of it, if, if the types of savings that you are noting uh, are potentially in play. Is that a fair comment? Yes, it is, and it's something that uh, I think we, we have yet to work out. But certainly, um, we did actually do a, a trial uh, of this approach um, in, in Ghana, in the city of Accra, in the greater metropolitan area, where we supported the greater metropolitan area and all the different districts within there to work together to provide a, 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 a planning outcome for water and sanitation. And we built a, an integrated systems model with them for that, that all the different agencies and the different districts, of course, you've got lots of different districts. It, it, it's very complicated. Very often, it's not just a single organization looking after a place. Uh, and they found huge benefits in having a common data platform and a common approach that everyone could share. So you could actually look at the benefits of, of, of looking at solutions across a wider geography than just the downtown area of the city uh, and so on, and bringing in nature-based solutions as well. So, so I think the, the sort of governance structures that we imagine happening might be a sort of collaborative laboratory that you could set up within your within the city that provides uh, this sort of support um, system, uh, maybe supported by a local university, uh, local universities who, who can, can constantly improve and build an integrated systems model that everyone in the city can use for the benefit of the uh, of all the communities, uh, all, all, all the people, including the finance community, uh, and that can be constantly improved and updated and upgraded. Uh, so it's it's a little bit independent from everyone else, and I think some sort of um, organisation like that might be very helpful. But but I, we, it hasn't been done yet, really. So it's early days. So I, I get the issue. I mean, what bankers like are obviously markets with uh, clean criteria. Uh, self-regulated as is feasible uh, but what you're saying equally as well on the flip side of the equation is that there is a danger of greenwashing there is a danger that the value of, of a systems approach uh, uh, is ignored uh, so perhaps we can come back to this issue of greenwashing in terms of your your individual jurisdictions uh, how are you each each looking at that issue uh, this sort of trade-off between we want to engage the investors but we really do need to ensure that this is going to impact on uh, on the social issue. Christelle, perhaps if I, I can pitch it to you first. Great, absolutely. Thanks, Arthur. So I suppose it, it comes at a number of points uh, in the South African context. So the, the first is, again, to note that within domestic markets, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange has a regulatory function, much as any stock exchange would do. Uh, and that regulatory function uh, specifically includes standards that require external verification. So the external reviewer approach is adopted. Um, and as part of that, it has been, a, in my experience at any rate, a, a learning process. So what does credibility look like? Um, and when it's quite broad, that means uh, that they have to learn as they go. Uh, at any rate, the point is the external reviewer process is brought into play there. Um, and in time, the expectations of the, the competencies of those external reviewers, I think, has increased. Um, what that means is that there is a potential issue around new entrants, um, where you now have very few international in, uh, incumbents who provide those services um, and have are able to demonstrate the sort of multidisciplinary um, uh, expertise 
to provide that that third party or second party opinion. Um, what the challenge there also brings into play is again the cost question and the dynamism by which um, those actors need to participate, um, which adds friction but is so necessary in the context of protecting the market credibility. So I'm never quite sure where the answer lies, but it has at least in the South African context been institutionalized. So the, the question isn't open any longer, really, if you want to list it um, domestically. Thank you very much. Maya, do, do you have a view on this? Yes, similar, very similar. Like, like, likewise, we also, this is also a challenge, and as the CNB colleague explained, we have these guidelines. We also are working with national universities in developing a most more affordable verification uh, systems to allow uh, small uh, companies or small investors also to small more of, yes smaller issuances, and that's been providing very good results that to just to, to have access to most affordable yes verifications to compare your opinion because one of the main barriers that we are listening from uh, is the high cost and what's the return instead if if there's no different in the yield or in the at, at the end of the day why should i be doing all this process so trying to put and make available from also the public sector and from the from from our side most affordable uh, well, verifications and compared to the opinion, uh, connecting all the, the stakeholders and, uh, and make raise awareness and also uh, making sure that all the partners know what this is, why this is really important and what the, the importance of the, well, the, the impact investment overall. But yes, we are working on this as well. And, and I agree with what Crystal said, and we are facing similar challenges in Argentina. Very interesting. Uh, Yoko, I know you've got very heavy rain that's uh, precluding you from probably hearing this question clearly, but hopefully it's uh, calmed down a bit. Uh, do you have a view on this question? Yeah, that only a small uh, uh, view, yeah. Uh, there's there's, there's uh, Crystal and also Maya uh, mentioned before that we are always working under the guidelines. And uh, don't forget, uh, besides we put the, the uh, use of proceed, we also put terms yeah, exclusion. Yeah, we can exclude uh, several items. Yeah, this the and uh, this finance uh, cannot uh, finance all related material with uh, fossil fuel, and then we can put all related with the uh, greenwashing activity. And how to detect the greenwashing activity? Uh, from uh, our experience, we uh, we also invite from the police administration and also all the the, the uh, uh, technical uh, related uh, ministry to detect, okay, if we can uh, uh, find that the source of money, uh, uh, we can detect as a greenwashing activity. So we can exclude uh, a, a sin uh, uh, from the beginning, and then we can avoid uh, green suko and also green uh, bond just a, a mechanism to do what we call a greenwashing activity. And are there specific Shiraya criteria that you also have to adhere to? And, I, and I'm aware that yeah. Shiraya criteria change by country as well. Yeah. yeah. Are, are there specific ones that you have to apply or you find in Shiraya law that, that constrain what you can do in addition to the, the other arguments or, or, or are they more or less the same? No, no, no. Uh, uh, you mean uh, related with the greenwashing activity? Exactly. I mean, in terms of constraints, in terms of what you can do. Yeah, we just put. Yeah, we just put uh, on the document on the guideline. We put uh, as a uh, exclusion uh, activity, and then uh, we deal and also uh, uh, link it, invite it. Uh, a, a police administration and also uh, interlink ministries. Uh, uh, with uh, the authority uh, to detect the greenwashing from the beginning, yeah, and then we invite them to evaluate and also to monitor uh, our guideline and also our green impact report. Okay, and is that voluntary or is that mandatory? Mandatory. Mandatory. Okay. And this is uh, and this is also very challenging. Yeah, I mean, 
it it is not easy, particularly when we when we compare uh, when we uh, create framework from the beginning and then when we uh, set up uh, what we call uh, uh, green impact report. Because when we set the green impact report, it consists all the uh, line minister and also all the sectoral uh activity so you can imagine how to inline all the uh, different sectoral uh, to do uh, synchronous and harmonious but this is uh, uh, what we already uh, uh, done and also mandatory for all all the uh, line minister and also all the stakeholder excellent and and it, peter if i can come back to you in terms of deepening the market and the opportunities. I mean, clearly we see this huge growth in, in, in the green bond market, and I'll, and I'll ask you all of you this question. Where do you see the, the biggest opportunities in terms of, uh, of deepening the capital markets and capital flows uh, in this marketplace? Well, I, th I think in terms of um, um, outcomes, it's definitely, in my view, is improving the resilience of of, of the whole system. So it, a lot of it now is, is, about, um, is about improving risk management, um, dealing with climate risks, as well as delivering the transitions to renewable energy, electrification, uh, and improving robustness of food and water systems, uh, clearly managing waste too. Um, and all of those are, are a sort of systems approach really. Um, if I can give you an example, uh, things like anaerobic digestion, which produce gas, which can be used for cooking in cities, also produce um, uh, compost for, for growing food. Um, it's that sort of um, system solution, which is much more powerful than, you know, just taking um, uh, bio waste and, and, and processing it and not, and not getting the outcomes from it. Uh, and similar electrification involves batteries as well as generation, and the batteries mean that you can actually knock out a huge amount of investment in in generation because you can get the generation from batteries in the peak. Um, things like that, um, system solutions like that, mean a dramatic reduction in total cost uh, to deliver the outcomes. And I think that's where the real uh, the the real innovation and the real sort of um, uh, new, new areas of thinking will come, which will make this this money go a lot further and, and have a lot more impact locally. Uh, uh, Christelle, I see you nodding your head. You're you're in agreement with that? Yeah, in, I mean, in, in every way. <laughs> um, I mean, I think in the South African context, again, it's you know, pockets are are not deep enough locally. We need to we need to attract international finance in the first place. At the same time, we have this exceptional development and transition needs. So it happens all at once. So we have infrastructure development requirements, we have new technologies and new industries developments like bioenergy, um, like hydrogen, for example, is on everyone's uh, in everyone's mind here. At the same time, we need to do energy transitions and we need to do transportation system transitions. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of energy, water and other nexus points in the country that are needing to move and that funding and financing needs to come together and at the same time we need to be able to come about with ways of of, of blending that attract private capital to these often public sector uh, led challenges um, as well as lining up, sort of lining up institutional investors. So there's all of these ecosystem actors that we need to combine in a function, um, and bonds is, is one of the, the multitude of options in which that blending could happen um, with this very exciting change in the economy that needs to play out in the following very soon, but out into 30 years. So yes. So it's bringing innovation from other sectors of, of, of the Western financial markets and injecting them also into your local capital markets as well. Maya, Maya, do you have a view on the, these questions? And and as, as a follow in there's an interesting question uh, which is coming up, which, which uh, Yoko, I'd like your comment on. Uh, people asking, uh, firstly, can you issue that uh, that green bond report that that, that that you noted? I think participants would probably find that useful. Uh, but secondly, what are the sanctions if if you find that people are not uh, uh, not complying uh, uh, with well, our greenwashing period in in the scheme of things? Uh, but Maya, first over to you, if I may. 
Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, definitely there, there are opportunities and we we see that so for developing the local capital markets to increase the, the investor base, to diversify the investor base, this is uh, very important and, and, and critical in, in the sense. Also facing the, many of the challenges that, uh, that Peter just said, we totally also agree with that. And in Argentina, we see climate change as one of the main challenges the, that the humanity faces. We see this as a problem, a long-term, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, that has impacts in our economy, long-term impacts. Is that this is a balance of payment, actually. Uh, with balance of payments consequences, a long-term issue that leads long-term financing. Uh, so we need to increase, of course, financing long-term uh, to also transform our productive systems. And to be able to do that and to be competitive and to incorporate all the risks associated with climate change that we need this financing, we need to also incorporate and to make sure that all the stakeholders are, are, are involved and to, to be able to comply to achieve actually SDGs, we cannot do, a, a, do that alone from the public sector. So, uh, well, this is a, a critical, critical challenge and that we need to, to face. Indeed, thank you very much. Uh, Yoko, in terms of the, the sanctions question, uh, what, are, what are your 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 position if, if somebody's clearly been seen greenwashing? Yeah, of course we stop the finance and and, and they must be substituted uh, substituted uh, to the uh, other uh, activity. Okay, very clear. Uh, there's an interesting question from David Ruhani, if I may read out. The path to decarbonisation requires not only the facilitating funding for sustainable projects, but also exiting funding that causes environmental harm as quickly as possible. How can we use the instruments you have presented to convince financial actors to abandon dirty investments? Crystal, I'll put you on the spot. I think it's a great question. Um, maybe I'll I'll try to keep it narrow and quick, but start at the the more principles basis uh, before the the instruments uh, consideration. So, um, I mean, in part, we see this taking place as individual institutions are adopting uh, frameworks and methods that help them actually assess the risk um, for this greening finance necessity. Um, and again, in the South African context, there are programs to try and support that. Uh, again, as mainstreamed practices to actually adopt principles, adopt the right kind of methodologies, do that bottom-up analysis of risk and opportunity, and start to pivot uh, capital allocation. So TCFD is again a, like a clear example, but there are so many others, of course, because it's not solely related to climate change. Um, if you then think about it from a regulatory or a top-down perspective, there's an interesting conversation that can be had around uh, just the, the power of peer disclosure um, so using the likes of taxonomies that at the moment have been on the incentive side, on the green recognition side, by comparison, once you start to showcase what is aligned, it shows, it shows very starkly what is not aligned. Um, and perhaps even in the extension to non-compatible. So in the EU example, that's uh, going to be an interesting place in which you start to see that composition of, of uh, finance um, potentially move um, as that takes place. In terms of these instruments, again, I think that it's it's super exciting, the idea of having labels. Um, I have the in my mind that you don't have the alternative label, though, necessarily, right? You don't have a name and shame uh, on things that are not green labeled, for example, or not socially contributive, um, because that's just not the way in which this market has evolved. And maybe I'll leave that there with that slightly uh, unhelpful or contentious statement. <laughs> No, no, do we like contentious statements? So, Peter, do you have a view on this? I think the um, is to have a transparent risk assessment process that that re requires everyone who's making investments in your country to 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 demonstrate the the risks associated with it. Uh, and if you do that, then it'll be very clear that that the things that I think David is hinting at will come out as being really risky. Um, I mean, very simply, fossil fuels are, are, are basically going to be stranded assets. So, I mean, just from that point of view, it's very risky. Um, but, uh, but also, of course, it's risky from the point of view of accelerating climate change and everything else. So I think, I think people should be required uh, explicitly to, uh, uh, to, you know, to come out with that, with that risk assessment. 
And I guess that, that gets to the issue of how do you price effectively what, what the UN Secretary General call for the externalities, both the negative externalities, but also, and I think somebody's touched on this in the questions, uh, the benefit of the positive externalities uh, in terms of the innovation that you find locally and the impact that that positively has uh, on, uh, on, on solving the SDGs. Uh, Yoko, in, in terms of, of your view, do you think the, the, these, these are fair yeah. comments? Yeah, this is easy to to exclude yeah, the dirty investment because we put directly and also uh, specifically from the uh, uh, framework uh, uh, just for the example when uh, when we put and also set the SDG framework, we exclude almost uh, uh, 20 uh, bad list activity, including luxurious uh, luxury sector, child labor, forced labor, adult entertainment, weapon, alcohol, tobacco, fossil fuel, nuclear and related asset, hydropower, biomass, even this is uh, uh, include uh, renewable energy, but if the this biomass will derive, uh, derive it from source that compete with the uh, food production, with the previous high uh, biodiversity, decrease uh, carbon pool in soil, and et cetera, and also infrastructure project with highly polluting or carbon intensive in nature, such as uh, airport and also new road. Yeah, so very detailed and also very uh, uh, generous. Agriculture, uh, uh, sorry, agriculture uh, project related with the forest conversion and also including palm, uh, palm oil uh, projection and also other industrial agriculture, including plantation forest. So you can imagine, yeah, we have almost all the dirty negative list activity. We exclude first. After. I, I, I can see Peter sort of clapping there on the right hand side, so he clearly agrees with you. Uh, we've got about five, ten minutes left, and, and I know Jessica will be deeply unhappy if we if we don't adhere to the time. Uh, so perhaps I can ask you all very briefly uh, the question. Uh, in terms of, of what you're all individually doing, are your governments supportive and what should they be doing? And indeed, what should uh, GGKP doing, uh, be doing in terms of, of deepening this agenda that we've all touched upon today? Maya, if I ask you that question first. Yes, yeah, certainly what we have this uh, round table that is um, all the participants from the public sector, the private sector has an analog also a round table and we very much have support from from our authorities and we think as I, I was saying that as Argentina as a country that this is an important that well climate change one of aspects of sustainability that is climate is uh, really one of the major challenges of humanity and we really are supportive of all initiatives toward trying to tackle it and and get uh, well of course understanding particularities of emerging economies, what can we do from our side, how can we contribute, and how can we learn from each other, right? And so we try, we are very active in our, all the forums that we participate, bringing our own experience and try to also learn from others as we did today, that it was very enlightening and interesting. And we can, I, I will also, certainly we contact you privately to, to understand and to try to focus mainly different issues that that we discussed today because we also in Argentina need to to, to still learn and incorporate this this um, these topics in all the institutions that participate and but what what I can say is that we are all very committed with it. Excellent. Uh Yoko, same question to you. Is your government supportive and and, and indeed what can the other stakeholders do to help you uh in, in what you're doing? Yes, You're of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course, Arthur. Because from the uh, Ministry of Finance uh, perspective, we already commit, and also we put the sustainability as the top priority. That's your uh, small information that uh, currently we we are lead from the uh, uh, Finance Minister Coalition uh, for the Climate Action under the Helsinki Principle. Yeah, we selected uh, replacing the Ministry of Finance of Chile. And then uh, next year, uh, we will have the G20 meeting. Yeah, so please come to our country. Yeah, 
please come to Bali, yeah, the big, and the, the a very beautiful island in the world. And uh, through this roundtable country exchange and, and mutual learning, uh, perhaps we could learn each other and also keeping another op uh, opportunity and also another motivation to do at the same level and the same playing field. Because if if we just uh, rely on the government budget, of course we have uh, a lack of the capacity. So we have go to the market, we have deal to the market, we have uh, create uh, uh, all the potential uh, uh, solution and also uh, a very innovative financing because sustainability is not only talk, but we have to implement it. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much. And South Africa, I'll ask the question to, to South Africa broadly, because clearly you, you're at an earlier stage, uh, certainly at the municipal level. Is your government being supportive and, and what 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 can you, uh, what would you like them to do more? And, and in terms of uh, the various other stakeholders that's in the equation, who, who can help you the most? Uh, thank you, Arthur. Um, so definitely our government uh, is very supportive in the process. Um, we, um, so as part of um, engagement with our national treasury, um, they, uh, we have been having discussions around uh, climate change and impact and how municipalities are budgeting for uh, the various um, uh, uh, impact uh, of, of that we've seen around climate change. Um, you know, uh, for example, you know, the flooding that takes place and all of that, how uh, municipalities are making sure that there's adequate uh, uh, budgeting around uh, those um, items. But also there have been discussions around um, making sure that we do have action plans in place and um, making sure that there's understanding, um, you know, of, of the various um, um, methods in which we can then mitigate um, or, you know, adapt um, uh, towards climate change and and also our Department of Environmental Affairs, uh, they've also been, um, uh, our facility sustainability unit has been engaging with them and they've been, uh, stake, uh, in, we've been engaging with them as part of the stakeholders of developing our climate action plan. Um, and certainly when we do, uh, as we're developing the um, our uh, green bond framework, we will definitely then also engage with our national treasury um, to make sure that, um, you know, all the, um, in terms of, from a legislative point of view, that we are um, aligned in terms of the issuing, um, or, you know, if whenever we get to that stage that we are definitely aligned and we have, uh, we are uh, compliant with all the uh, uh, regulations. Excellent. And um, Peter, same question to you. Um, yeah, I think I think one one of the things that the world r really needs, I think, is is um, is is a data system that that can really support all of these activities, uh, which is uh, which is open and transparent and uh, and has uh, standard data specifications within it, linked to. Um, linked to the uh, frameworks you've been talking about, and, and it does seem to me that that would be extremely helpful. Uh, it only needs to be created once, and, and then the whole world could use it, and it could save you a huge amount of time and effort in actually uh, and accelerate the implementation. So, so one of the things that I th I think it would be useful for governments to come together, uh, maybe at the G20 meeting. Um, Yoko, maybe that's one of the things you could look at is the common data infrastructure that that could be created once and the whole world can use. Uh, that might be a very helpful way of accelerating change. So a, a data commons that is controlled, open, multilateral, as opposed yeah. to privatized and, and, uh, and national, which of course is is clearly the threat with, with, with new economy models. Uh, it's now 3.34, so we're, we're four very soon. So I think uh, I, I want to thank all the panelists for their, their input. Uh, I am reminded of the words uh, by, uh, by Bill Clinton, that the problems of the 20th century have been solved by someone somewhere. The challenge of the 21st century is how we scale them. And I think today we've touched upon a lot of the salient issues in terms of the role of standards versus greenwashing, uh, the opportunities of thinking about these things on, on a systems level. And I think what's been most interesting to me, the, the opportunity in the local capital markets and how we 
uh, align local capital with, with local solutions? What are, the, what are the other tools that can help, help deepen innovation beyond the municipalities uh, into the rest of the economy? So aligning capital markets for their own, local capital markets for their own essential development. Uh, and finally, again, on display was, was the innovation, but how do we take that innovation further as somebody, I think it was you said, Yoko said, in terms of, of deepening by, by the respective side as well. So firstly, a big thank you to the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership uh, and to, to GIZ in terms of their support of this process. Uh, and thank you all very much indeed for your time. And thank you very much, members of the audience, for your question. Thank you very much indeed and a very good afternoon. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jessica.